This is Thinking Biblically. I'm Alan Gilman, and today my guest and I will be discussing the reality of abuse. As this is a painful subject for many, I want to let you know beforehand. Welcome back to Thinking Biblically, a podcast dedicated to exploring how all scripture speaks to all of life. Please don't forget to subscribe, share, like, and comment, review. This all helps in getting this podcast out to more people. Also, your support is greatly appreciated. And so how to make a donation is described in the description. To help us look at today's uh, serious topic is one of my own sons, Josh Gilman. Josh has been speaking to parents and youth about the harms of exploitive content since 2015. It was by sharing his own story of pain and redemption that doors in every kind of setting opened to him to speak to those who are hurting as well as to those who care about protecting the next generation. A speechwriter and broadcaster by trade, Josh's dream is for his own daughters and sons to grow up in a world where the truth about the value of every child is understood. Josh is married to Megan, and they are the parents to five of my grandchildren. It's great to see you, Josh. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, and so um, I need to tell people that the thing that helped bring this about is that you've published your first illustrated children's book, The King's Daughter. Yes, I did not illustrate it. Um, yes. but it is, it is beautifully illustrated by my friend, Jeff, who did a phenomenal job. Yes, indeed. Now, as I was thinking about this, um, and of course I've known you, um, for most of your life and I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell any of those stories, th those, those stories that I know that I'm not going to share. Um, but I was thinking about how with all the things that you dreamt of being and doing and all the various projects that you uh, have done many very successfully, I don't recall you ever saying, hey, dad, I want to write an illustrated children's book. So uh, <laughs> are, are you more, are, you're probably more surprised than anybody else. Somewhat. Um... In fact, one of the reasons why this even came about was I was working on a different project that I've never finished um, on a related topic, and it was targeted for an older audience, and it was not a children's book. And I sent it out for feedback, and a lot of people were sending back feedback, and it was pretty positive, a lot of really, really good feedback. And then our pastor actually emailed me back and said, this should be a children's book. And he was always giving me different ideas for things. And he's amazing at having ideas, but because he always gives me lots and lots of ideas, I didn't really think about it as something that, oh, definitely, because it wasn't what it was, right? It was, it was totally, it was a totally different thing. And so saying, you think that it was, it wasn't book, what, it wasn't what it was no, that it, it was? It, exactly. You nailed it. And so didn't really register in my mind as real feedback. Um, but then when I, I had the experience, which I describe in the, in the back of the book um, of sharing with a group of youth. And then as I'm sharing with them, having this story just pop into my mind um, as, as kind of a, a parable and then sharing that with them, it just, it clicked. And it went that, that needs to be a children's book. Um, and I've always in my journey of speaking to all sorts of audiences about issues around broken sexuality, around pornography, around abuse and exploitation of every kind. Um, I've always been, been really, been most passionate about speaking to parents because if I can help the parents speak to their kids, then I don't need to go speak to their kids when they get to youth group. I don't need to go into their high schools if the parents are equipped to talk about these things with their own children. And so I had the passion as soon as I got into this space of speaking to parents, but I don't think I ever saw myself writing children's books. And, and now this has happened and it's had some really great feedback already um, from all sorts of folks. It's really, it's really humbling to see something like this have an impact on people's lives. And now I have ideas for more children's books. So I'll see what comes from here. So how do you how do you want to do this? Do you want to 
because you already alluded to that occasion and it's mentioned as you said in the back of the book uh that where you got inspired on the spot to to share a parable uh with this this girl right um did you want to share more of that story or do you want to go more into the background of what led you to being there in the first place let's start with the end first um okay. or at least tease it a little bit um so I also want to say that as we as we talk about these topics, um, I don't consider myself an expert. Um, I consider myself a father who really cares about these issues and is trying to learn as much as I can. And in that journey, I I do think that I have learned some things that I can share with others. Um, but I, I by no means think that I'm like the expert on the subject. And if I say something that people think is a little bit off or whatever. Um, that's, that's fine. You can think that, um, and you might be right and, and go out and search out more truths on these things. If you think that anything I say is, is, is questionable, um, go ahead, please find, find the truth, go out there and find it. Um, and let me know if you find something that I said is wrong. Um, I, I want to know more and more. Um, I was standing in front of a group of youth in Vancouver, which is not where I live. And it was the most crazy random happenstance. They ended up there in the first place. It was a literal chance meeting with some people and they said, come speak to our youth. And so there was Sunday morning. I didn't even know the name of the church that I was at. Um, and I was sharing with these youth. And normally in this talk, which was mostly centered around the impact of pornography and the lies that it tells them about themselves and the way they treat each other. and I was at the point in this talk where I would normally look, look at the kids, and it's my favorite part of the talk where I get to say, there is nothing that you can do that would make God love you any more or any less. And that's such a key moment in my own testimony. That's such a turning point in my life. And, and I was really excited to share that because it's just been this key for me. And as I said it, I caught the eyes of this, of this young girl, young teen, I believe and her eyes dropped. And it was like in a moment, I saw the entire story written on her face, that it was not something that had been, something, not something she had done, that she felt had removed her value, that had lessened her worth. It was something that had been done to her. And I realized that what I had said for so many other presentations to so many other youth wasn't enough it wasn't the full story and i remembered the fact that the statistics are true that one in three girls and one in four to one in six depending on which study you're reading of boys has been abused um i remembered that it was true and i hadn't told the whole story and so this story just poured out of me about a princess and her father, who's the king. And, and I told this story of how there's nothing that she could do to make her not a princess. She is a princess. She's her father's daughter and he loves her because of, because of that, no matter what happens to her. And, and that was a key moment in my journey of trying to speak about these things. And the story just, came out of me. And ever since then, I've tried to remember that more and more, that so many people out there in the world are carrying a lack of self-worth, think they have no value. And it's because of something that was done to them. Like we've all done things that we regret and make ourselves think less of ourselves. There's a lot of people, a lot of people who have had things done to them. And they think that has taken away their value and they're wrong. they're wrong. And, and I what, think about, what, can you share a little more about how you realized that for yourself? Cause you alluded to that. Mm -hmm. I think so, that'd be important for people to hear. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in a great family. I had a great dad. Um, 
I always tell people when I share my story, that I, I do tell them I had, I had a wonderful dad who knew the Bible, who's a Bible teacher. Like if anybody knew the truth, he knew the truth. I didn't grow up in a house full of lies. Uh, we, we knew the truth. I, I grew up in a, in a family with a mom who not only loved me, but this is a statistical crazy part. Her dad loved her. So I'm second generation loved. Not many people are. So I had every reason to have what I needed to have all the self-worth and know the truth that, that I could possibly have. I was set up for success. However, we live in a broken world and sure, every family is going to have things in it that are not, you know, the best. Every parent is going to make mistakes, but also we live in a world where the average age of exposure to pornography is about eight years old, where um, virtually everybody, statistically everyone will encounter pornography before the age of 18 at some point, somehow. Um, for proof of that statistic, I was once at a conference of a thousand people, and these are mostly Christians, mostly people in ministries or working for charities or whatever it was. And someone said, has anybody here never, ever seen anything? And one person put up their hand. Um, and so that's the world we live in. So when I was eight years Let, old- let's stop, let's stop there just for a second, because this is one of those things people don't believe. The ones who yes. don't believe. So, of course, all these people have been exposed, but there, would you agree that there's lots of, of parents who not only they don't know what their kids are doing, but now their kids are grown up and they don't know what their kids did. Yes. That they think everything was fine. And we want as parents to believe that our kids are the one. And even if we, even if we know, like statistically, um, there's the hope that my kid is going to be the one, right? Mine is the one in 1000 who's going to put his hand up. And what we need to understand is that kind of, so what if 999 people have been impacted by pornography and your kid is the one, then the world they're interacting with is still pornified. There's still an unhealthy view of sexuality, an unhealthy view of sex, an unhealthy view of how men and women are supposed to treat each other. That is all around them. And so when we talk about being in a pornified world, we, um, that's, that's what we're trying to get across. Now we want to get, we'll get back get eventually. We'll get back to the relationship of the pornified world to this, to what you saw in that girl that day and how you were able to speak into that, and how that's expressed in the, in the book. Um, but this whole thing that young children are looking at um very very horrific forms of pornography behind their parents backs is still something that parents are really clued out about and you know in our home uh we were aware of the of some of the danger i spent years being a computer guy so we knew all about that. Now it didn't help. We had great into always had great internet in our house <laughs> um, because that was that was important to me and my work and all this kind of thing. And so um, my my kids learned to be pretty cons computer savvy quick because I had the knowledge. I used to be a computer trainer myself, so I knew all about that stuff. So then to realize there was these things happening was devastating f for me because it was not only happening on my watch, but it's like, I should have known better. And it's a horrible thought to think that, that, you know, some of the aspects of your story, which I'll leave for you to tell. Um, but that only goes to show, cause I, I'm not the, I'm not an anomaly, right? This is very, very common. And one of the things I find that is so difficult to help people who don't understand to understand is they don't understand what it is their kids are actually watching because some of us who maybe had some sort of relationship to pornography when we were younger it's it wasn't good but compared to what's being um encountered now there is no comparison so do you want to take a moment to try to explain a little more about when you talk about a pornified world what is this world that that we're in 
Yeah. Um, the majority of children before they're in their teens will not just have seen sexual content, but by that, what we actually mean, what they're seeing is generally violent, degrading acts done to people. The most common first exposure to pornography that a child, and I mean that a child, not youth, not a teenager, a child will see is non is at least being what's on the screen, whether it actually is real or, or not real or not, um, is going to involve more than two people and be non-consensual. And when you, you were a little struggling too with the consensual, non-consensual, and whether it was an act or not an act, the fact is the acting is still real. The acting and is a lot real. of the actors very quickly are 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 gobbled up by non-consensual acts. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so pornography does not portray violence. It is violence. They don't use stunt doubles. And the majority of pornography online is violent. Okay. Um, let's, so when we talk about violent degrading acts, again, we're not talking about, oh no, there's some more skin on the screen than we would wish. We're not talking about R-rated movie scenes. We're talking about things that if you did it to somebody in public, you'd go to jail. These, these are violent. And so again, if it doesn't matter if whether or not it's, it's, um, done on an expense expensive for the industry set uh it doesn't matter how much they're getting paid not paid whether uh there's there's a lot of content out there that is was filmed non-consensually and so it's all mixed together like that's why i said it's, it's all a mess and people will, will argue about the ethics of the industry and all different things once you're online consuming it you don't know the difference and so that's why that is what children are taking in um, and so when we're out there trying to talk to them about their self-worth, when they're seeing that sexuality involves degrading violent acts, that's their first exposure. Trying to tell them that people are worth dignity and respect is actually very counter to the culture they've already encountered. So how did that message get through to you? So I, like, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties. I was growing up during like the transition. So the first time I saw something, it was a magazine just lying on the street. Um, right. And, and we were, that actually happened while we were out for a walk with the family. And so, you know, mom grabbed that magazine and threw it away in a garbage can. But by the time I was 14, right, it was the internet and that, that happened so fast. And so that's where you do, you get a bit of a, um, a generational gap in terms of how this works. Cause again, a lot of, a lot of parents, they grew up when their testimony is, Oh, I found this magazine or VHS tape. I remember someone getting up at church and sharing about how he got saved and he threw his porn away. And I saw all the university students looking at each other, like, how do you throw porn away? Cause they never went to a store. They never went to the back room and exchanged money and said, here, I'd like this pornography, please. Um, it's the internet. It's everything that's ever been been made. And quite literally, there's so much of it. You could not watch pornography every second of your life and finish it. Like there's there's so much of it. And so much of the web is that. And people, parents especially, need to understand that like your child seeing pornography is not a side effect. It's like people want to talk like, oh, we built this culture where we're all open about our sexuality and whatever. And like on the bottle, it says like, you know, may may accidental cause accidental exposure to children. And that's how they talk about it. Like, well, that's not what it's made for. Right. We, we let's be responsible with this. Your children seeing pornography are the business model of the porn industry. The way that they make their hundred billion dollars a year is your children see content that is manufactured to be addictive, chemically addicting to their brain, overwhelms their brain with 200% of the dopamine that their brain is capable of handling. It shuts down the prefrontal cortex and stunts its growth so that it doesn't develop, so that the ability to make decisions is actually removed from them and that isn't able to mature. And so that happens to them. They become addicted or just develop a habit, whatever people want to call it, because people want to argue about the term sometimes, they develop a habit, a compulsion, whatever. And now they're watching lots and lots and lots of content 
possibly escalating to where they need to pay for something, right? But it's it's now an ad-based industry, right? It's now an entire YouTube-like ecosystem in the porn industry. And, and so that's what they need. They need to create addicts. Um, I remember once seeing a, a scale or, or a chart and it was like, 90% of alcohol is consumed by 10% of the people who drink alcohol, right? Like it's another business where they're making their money. Like, sure, everybody drinks, but they're making the money off the people who drink too much. Pornography, they want to expose to everybody because they, they want the addicts. And your child is their target audience. And so it's not a byproduct of uh, a sexualized society industry. It's the intent of the industry is for your child to see pornography. Are you muted? Thank you so much. Um, you were going to explain how you got the message of your of your value. Yes. Explaining this background is very, very helpful. So here <laughs> you are with your so here I am you say better, your, your frontal yeah. cortex is shot. Yeah. And so for anyone who's ever experienced this, like, this is why people say, I didn't want it. Like, I don't know what I was doing. I didn't want to. And it's not an excuse. It's not saying what you did. Well, it's not your fault because you're still the one that did it, but you literally are having the part of your brain that makes decisions uh, is damaged. It's stunted. Um, that's normally not fully developed until you're about 25. Um, which is Maybe that's why they let you rent cars after that. But like, that is, that is how, how your brain works. And so here I am consuming content. And the problem is that in order to watch pornography and live with yourself, one needs to believe a certain lie, which is that the people on the screen don't matter, that they can exist for your enjoyment, that their sexual activity their person can exist for your enjoyment. And if that is a thing, then they must not have value. If they have value, it's very obvious that this shouldn't be happening. And I always, the way I just say it is like the, the sin of pornography is not seeing skin. It's not seeing sex. The sin of pornography is sacrificing another human on an altar to yourself. It's saying you exist for my enjoyment. That's the real brokenness that pornography is. Um, and so in order to perpetuate that, you have to come to the conclusion that the people on screen don't matter. The problem is if they don't matter, what is the difference between you and them? And so as I continued to be pulled into this I believed that I didn't matter. I couldn't. Like, because if I mattered, then they mattered, and I couldn't live with myself if they mattered. And so that is a lie just perpetuated. And I would, I would quite literally, almost every night, look at myself in the eyes in the mirror and say, I hate you. Because I had to. It's the only way I could sleep at night. And, and so that was what was going over and over in my head. And again, like, you're my dad. <laughs> And you're telling me the truths of the Bible and you guys love me. And I had siblings that I loved. Like I had every reason to know that I was loved, but the power of the lie was stronger because I needed it to be. I needed it to be stronger. And so what happened to me was, and I couldn't put a specific date or pinpoint on it but it was it was that one day it just the thought entered my brain and stuck that maybe god is true not true in in me like i always believe that god was real but maybe what he says is actually true because other things in my life were changing as, as God kind of got a hold of me and all these other things in my life were, were improving, but this area wasn't. But as I, as I realized that, that God was true, but all these other things in life, that what he said was true, then maybe the part where he said 
that I'm a son of the king is also true, which means that I can't change it. And if I can't change it, I better deal with it. And if, if I am a son of the king, if I'm a creation of the creator, if he made me on purpose for a purpose, all these things that are in the Bible are true. They're true. And I can't change it. And I, there's nothing that I can do. And so it doesn't actually matter how much pornography I watch. I'm still a son of the King of Kings. It doesn't matter how much pornography I watch. I am still a creation of the creator who is the expert creator, who knows exactly what he's doing, who made me on purpose, who made me for a purpose. It doesn't matter how much pornography I watch. I can't change any of that, which means I matter. Yeah, and this is actually a part of the story that uh, either I've forgotten or I'm not fully aware of. Um, and as you were as you were telling this, I'm thinking back to those days and the process that we were all going through. We had just started going to a new fellowship, and I remember so uh, your mother and I checked it out first. Then we brought because uh, we were we were actually on a getaway and we <laughs> in our own city and we checked this place out uh, while we were away. And then we brought the kids after. And I remember, I think it was one of your first times there. We, the custom in this fellowship was to break up into groups of, of like of twos and threes, uh, guys with guys, girls with girls and share prayer requests and pray for one, for each other. And I think it was in your very first time you were with some guys, you were with some ex uh, drug addicts and other people uh, whose lives were so dramatically changed. And uh, your mom and I have stories of, of dramatic changes in our coming to know the Lord. Uh, but at that time of our life, we didn't really know a lot of people who had really been through some of the dark shadows of and the dregs of life and God miraculously rescued them. And, and now here you are encountering the reality of the truth of the Bible for the first time in, a, in, a, in this new way. And that was sort of the foundation of our community life in this, in this fellowship. So it sounds like, that was partly how the message was getting through to you. Is that correct? Not, no. I would say that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't key in that part. What that was key for, for me was the recovery process because these guys who had been in jail, who were recovering from every kind of drug addiction, again, like, like they were dealing with a lot of the same things as me in terms of like, it doesn't matter what I've done. Um, and also, I should finish that thought. It sounds like I just said, it doesn't matter what I've done. It doesn't matter what I've done. God still, his truth is still true about me. Um, but the other part was to take it seriously. And so sometimes what happens is we go, oh, see, God is true. And then people want to go, see, I know the truth. Now, now I'm free. Um, and I always think about it like people will say the truth will set you free. And like, Yes, but let's say you're a bird in a cage and someone goes here, we have the truth and they open the door of the cage. Um, if you don't know what direction to fly into, you're just going to keep on smashing your head against the side of the cage. You still need direction. You still need to know what to do next. A lot of people think that when you're, once you know the truth, then it's just, you're done. You're great. Now you know the truth, just move on from there. But you need to know what to do. You need to have direction. Um, you need to know what to do next in terms of acting on the truth, you know. And so those guys who, who understood the importance of intentionality in how you're living your life were such a big help to me. Um, and I mean, like one of them, one of them was so key. He was, he was the groomsman in, in my wedding party. Um, in terms of just saying like, you need to move on. And one of the best things he said to me was he was telling me how he did a lot of drugs in his past. And he was like, I can remember what drugs are like. I can remember what it's like to take that specific drug and the feeling that it gives you. And a lot of us, a lot of Christians, when we have memories and we have dreams and we have thoughts about stuff we've done or thought or whatever, or just picturing things we've seen, let's just start beating ourselves up. And he said, um, that's not who I am. I just have memories. And that was very, very helpful for me. 
to to realize that you can move past certain things and you know they'll always they happened they'll affect you but also you're just a person with memories and you're not you're not bound by that and so like that was the whole journey that I was taking into this ministry that I was taking into speaking to these kids and so it was actually kind of heartbreaking for me when I'm standing in front of this group of kids and I'm I'm speaking out of my own story and saying like this is the truth and and when I discover this when when I realized that I mattered, so they mattered, the ones on the screen. And, and if they matter, then it matters how I treat them. And, and that means that I don't need to just, it's not a, don't watch pornography because we shouldn't see sex. Don't watch pornography because they're not wearing enough clothes. Don't, all the, it's don't, don't watch pornography because these people on the screen are, are creations of God made on purpose for a purpose made with the most incredible, unchangeable, intrinsic value. And, and am I treating them like that? And, and, and that is what changed my whole relationship with this. And, and so I was there and I was passionate and I'd seen that message have a, have a great impact on a lot of people. And so then to have in that moment, the realization that that message didn't go far enough was kind of heartbreaking. And, and by then I think we had three kids. I think three kids by then my second daughter had been born by then. And so to realize that I hadn't gone far enough in preaching that message was, was kind of sad in the moment. And, and it's where that came. Um, the desire to do something about that because I always said that my goal for my daughters is to have them so secure in my love that if some guy ever said to them like, Hey girl, I'm the only one who loves you. You know, I'm the only one who loves you. I want I want them to laugh. I want them to laugh in his face. Um, and, and I also know that I'm, I'm not enough. They need more than, than me. They need to understand who they are fully, what their real identity is. And, and so that's where just the, the impetus came to start working on this and the journey, my own journey of trying to become a better father in this area to become more aware of the truth of all this and how to help people who have been through the worst things that can happen to a person has been, it's been a, a journey and, and it's been interesting to see because it was Daniel, my brother, your son who first started really encouraging us to speak more about the abuse side of the brokenness. And you don't want to even like, if you don't want to believe that your children might be the ones who see pornography, if that's a strong feeling, you really, really don't want to believe that your children could be the ones who are abused. And you want to believe that if you just live a nice life and try to hang around nice people, that you'll somehow just be able to skate through, but it's not true. It just factually isn't. Um, I wonder if there's still a lot of people that aren't making the same kind of connection that you are between watching pornography and the story of that girl who you believed had been sexually abused. I think most people would still see those as separate topics, but in your mind and how you're talking, they seem to be very, very connected. Can you explain? Yeah. Um, there's different ways to just, there's different ways it's connected, but I'll say the main way that I'm thinking of is the way that it attacks your identity. And there's, so there's two aspects that were, wanting to help people when it comes to the issues of abuse, particularly sexual abuse. Um, one is we want to live our lives in a way that we are going to be part of making sure it doesn't happen or is happening less, um, that we are the ones who can prevent it from happening. And that, that takes the acknowledgement that it does happen in the first place. We can't pretend it doesn't. And then secondly is for the fact that it does happen and it attacks the, the self-worth. Um, 
and the pornography is tied into it in two ways. Um, one, it it's attacking at times like the same issues, and especially when it comes to girls and, and guys. Guys deal with pornography and the way it affects them. Guys are abused, but pornography often we often say that it tells guys how to act. It tells girls who they are, and so it tells them what they're for and that they're to be treated a certain way, that they only exist for their bodies, that they're only worth what sexual pleasure they bring people. And obviously abuse is going to do its way worse. It's those same things a lot of times that's leading into that, but it's telling them that they're worthless, that they don't have value outside of themselves, that their bodies are simply for other people. They're not their own, um, that, that they don't have a lot of it comes down to they don't have value and it's, it's attacking this core core part of who people are. And so I want to make, I want to help people one know who they are because oftentimes people are abused. Like people still often think of sexual abuse as something that happens to people who are attacked. Um, right. It's the type of thing you might see in the news that there's some horrific attack and while that does happen the majority of sexual abuse is not happening in the scenarios it's happening to people who are made vulnerable over time to people who are groomed um, the majority of it is in family and friendship settings and so when we are able to build up the truths that we know that our children know to make them less um less impervious to those types of of attacks the mental attacks the grooming and i don't want to make it sound like anybody who has had this happen to them doesn't know the truth because that happens and uh but when we are all aware and we're it's a together thing like we have to do this it doesn't work it's it's not like oh i'm just going to tell my kids all these truths and it's and then they're throw them out there um because someone who's in a position of power an abuser it, it still has that power so has it abuse but it's it's when we're all aware as parents trying to help our children walking together walking in community being honest and open um that's where the strength can come from um the majority of and I feel like I'm going in a bunch of different directions here, but I just feel like I have to say some of these things. Like the majority of times it's somebody, it comes with someone's been abused. There's almost always a bystander who goes, I, I knew, I knew, I knew something was off. And so it's about like when we t- are honest about what's going on in the world and we're empowered to speak up because when we are because we acknowledge that it happens and it happens everywhere and it happens in our churches in our communities in our homes in our schools everywhere and we know that that can happen and then we say because we know it can happen and we all know that it could be anywhere then we're empowered to speak up you you see something you say something um i have a friend who was abused and and it was a family member. And I remember being a child and noticing something was off about that person um, and the way they were treating people. And I remember being very uncomfortable. And, and then when I found out as an adult what was actually going on, and I don't beat myself up for that. I was a kid. But if I was a kid noticing something was off, then there were adults who noticed something was off. And... I don't know if someone tried to help and was shut down, um, but we need to we need to be able to acknowledge this as well, that, a reality. No, so that that's part of the whole, I could almost call it the abuse culture. is It's a is a layer all to its own. The fact that people aren't speaking up and how these power structures work that keep people silent, people afraid to speak up, and and then when they do speak up, some of the things that do happen to perpetuate the um the abuse and the lies and and all the rest of it um but if i understand you correctly at the core of a lot of this and you said it more than once you know we were made on purpose and for a purpose and at the core of all this and this is not the only issue that the lack of understanding of this uh, affects if i said that properly um is is this thing of knowing who we are because 
and especially now more than ever in in the Western world, um, we don't know what human beings are for. We become we're commodities. We're like um, pleasure machines. We're all sorts of other things, but we've we don't know what it means to be made in the image of God, which I I define as being God's representatives on earth. That we are we are like ambassadors of heaven. We're representing the great King, and part of that is being His children, as 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 you've you've talked about. And when we don't know that. Um, what that ends up doing both for perpetrators and victims. Because if we simply are just commodi commodities unto one another, almost anything goes. And if, you know, I guess this is what I deserve. This is what I'm for. And it's, and it's horrific. And especially horrific when you contrast it with the, you know, a beautiful image of what we really are as daughters and sons of the great king. So how do we, and, how, apart from your book, is this, is this our yeah. only hope, Josh? Is everyone's no, got to get no. your book? And it, which they should, no. everybody get his book. They can if they want. Um, and again, like, I want to I wanna be very clear about where I see myself in this, because again, like I, I'm not an expert, um, and especially when it comes to like the healing side of this. Um, and I hope that what I'm trying to do with this book is, just almost be someone saying, Hey, remember this truth? Like there's this little key truth in here and all these problems happen when it's broken and all these problems might be fixed if we remember it's true. And I'm just trying to remind people and, and we're building a website that has more resources to better people than me, to people who really know what they're doing. Um, we're working on like a, a little mini book that, that is a lot more practical advice around these things. And again, it wasn't written by me. I'm just helping to, to put it together. Um, and so to give people some real practical tools and, and, and dealing with these things. Um, but, but I do think that it's that key of understanding what it is to be made in the image of God, of, of, of understanding what it is to be sons and daughters of the King of Kings. When we see people for who they really are, it does, it changes everything and it should change, not just how we see ourselves and our own children, but it's how we see everybody. Um, because the thing is, if I see, if I see um, someone that I know, and they're they're being attacked, I am much more likely to intervene than if I see an incident with some strangers over there. I think that's just going to be a, a natural emotional response. Um, but when we see people for who they really are, the extreme value. Um, one of the things I proudest I've done, uh, proudest things I've ever done in my life was helping to cultivate a culture in our church where all the young guys talked about the fact that like all the young women in our church, all the women in our church are like our sisters and they're, they're daughters of the King. And we had this incredible culture built where like, if some guy came in and it didn't matter if he was like dangerous, cause we had people at that church, we were downtown and we would wander in high or drunk or whatever, just off the street. It didn't matter if they were, potentially a physical threat or just someone that just had a real creepy vibe like some girl would be over there and like there would be a guy just over there like hey how's it going i'm so and so and just like interrupting and giving the giving the girls opportunities to get out of some pretty awkward and uncomfortable and sometimes dangerous situations where it became people knew that if this girl's in trouble there's multiple stories of girls ending up in in dangerous situations and calling guys in the church and it wasn't like this romantic thing or anything everyone just knew like you call these guys and like they'd be there they'd rescue them um find someone who's in trouble lost in this like in this neighborhood in the middle of the night and go get them and it's because like you we had this understanding of who they are right? it wasn't like oh go help this person they're cool and popular it was like go help this person daughter of the king and that's the attitude we need to have. That's what enables you to say something, no matter how uncomfortable it is. At some point, you also have to sense the permission or the calling that we're supposed to be involved in each other's lives. It's that's you know, so this whole thing of not my business, you know, and this sort of thing. And somehow, what you were describing, these guys and the girls got it that we were actually supposed to act like I was going to say family, but I should say functional family. Um, where we are responsible to uh, ask for help, 
offer help, be interested. This, you know, that very, uh, you know, one of the primary stories in the Bible, Cain and Abel and the thing, you know, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, and which was a way of, of Cain saying, hey, it's not, not really my business uh, when actually caring for one another is. I know we can meddle and we can go too far, but there, you know, there's something about your story or the original story about seeing the look on the face of that girl and picking up on that and speaking into that and the difference was, was there any follow-up? Do you, do you know anything after? I don't, I, uh, it was, it was such a random speaking engagement that I ended up in. Uh, I probably should have here. asked you this in our pre little pre-talk. So I wouldn't put you <laughs> on the spot right now, but no, I actually was thinking about it the other day. I need to try to track down just the people who invited me to that. They literally, we were at this like huge conference and they were like, Hey, come speak at our church. And they just drove me like 45 minutes away because they were going to have this thing. And they're like, no, we just canceled what we're going to do. You're the speaker. And I spoke <laughs> to these youth and they were like, great someone else is going to drive you back. And I was on a plane across the country three hours later to go back home. Um, it was, it was, a and, and to think of how that one thing has now led to all these other, these other things in my life. Um, I've actually been trying to figure out if I can find one of their phone numbers or something of the people who were putting that together because it's impacted my life. And I hope that that impact is now impacting other lives. See, it's um, when- what, when you realized that you were there to represent the king and you were encountering one of the king's daughters who was no longer seeing herself through the, through the king's eyes, you knew it was incumbent upon you to speak that truth. And very, very Messiah-like by doing a parable too, if I may say. Um, but we, we, have, we bear that responsibility, not for all 7 billion people on the planet at, at all times, that's impossible. Um, and I know some people are so conscientious, they get, they get crushed by that sense of responsibility, but that's not really our problem. Our problem is we're not caring enough about enough people. But that too goes back to the root of when we understand that we're sons and daughters of the King and we're representing him, we're on a mission to help reconcile people, reconcile people with that truth and help restore that relationship. And we might say that all that we've been talking about in terms of pornography, the people involved in producing the pornography and being in, in the, in the, in the pornography and the people consuming it have all lost touch with their value. And then we have the responsibility to, to, to help restore that. And, and that's what's going to make all the difference. Yeah. And one of the issues with pornography and one of the differences between pornography versus abuse that is done to you by somebody else is that when you're watching pornography, um, you're both perpetrator and victim. It's, it's trauma that is happening to you. Like watching pornography is actually traumatic. It is trauma to the brain. It is trauma to your soul. And so a lot of times when people realize, oh, I don't want this anymore, we focus on the fact of, oh, I'm doing bad things. And you need to deal with what you're doing. You need to deal with the fact that you are part of an abusive system. Um, yes, it's true. Your clicks are fueling the abuse of other people. At the same time, it's an industry that has targeted you. It's, it is designed to damage you it is traumatic and you are also a victim and you need to do with the fact that you've been hurt. And I think it's one of the reasons, I mean, I've countered this a lot. It's one of the reasons why it's really hard for people to get out of it because you could deal with what you've done, but if you don't deal with what was done to you, you're just going to fall back right. in because, because you haven't actually healed that entire cycle. Right. So and it's, it's self-harm. So it's consuming self -harm. pornography is self-harm as, as addictions are. Mm -hmm. on, on top of that, you're also helping to fuel the, the, the porn industry. And you're, so you're aiding and abetting a system that's destroying people's lives. But thanks be to God that there is a, a, there is a way out. And so um, I'm sure people watching this, it, first folks, it's hard to accept that even if we're not directly affected, 
and and it's wonderful for the few people percentage wise that have not been directly affected by either being the victims of sexual abuse or consuming pornography but in our families and our friends people are affected everywhere if we've been personally affected or we know someone who has been I know you're preparing this another set of resources, but these people can't wait. Where do they go if they do need help right now? Um, I'll start off. This used to be how I ended my uh, resources. I will start off by saying um, professional therapy. And I think the, the reason why I used to have that is like, I think it used to be talked about as if like, you know, do all these things. And if you really need a professional therapy, and then as I've gotten older and realized that all of us need professional therapy anyways, um, you might as well start there if you can, because no one is going to help you in terms of dealing with it's all that brokenness. Um, but like any type of thing, like, like any type of substance abuse, cause it's still, you're taking in something, you know, there, there's four keys. One is, is cut off access, right? If you were had a liquor problem and your uh, drinking problem and you're sitting in front of a liquor store someone's not like hey man i read this great book that'll help you and give it to you and leave you in front of the store it take you away right you go away you go to rehab you get away from it um and so doing whatever you can to to get away from it whether that's you know filters covenant eyes type things um there's lots of different types of tools It's, it's always changing it seems like but you can visit Covenant Eyes. You can go to strengthtofight.ca, which is uh, the website that I started. Um, especially if you're looking for stuff for your family, going to protectyoungeyes.com is a really, really good resource. Um, and so you want to do things to cut off from it. Um, and then secondly, you need to renew your mind. Um, again, going through places like Covenant Eyes um, has a lot of good resources for different programs and things like that. Therapy is going to be the biggest um, the, the biggest one to really, really find healing, um, because you need to have somebody help you change your thinking. Um, and then you need to, to change how you're living in terms of like pornography thrives. It's in the darkness. Um, you need to, to bring it out into the light for myself. Um, after I told all my roommates what I was dealing with and I wanted to change one of them, put a rock at the foot of my door so that my room was never shut. My door was never shut to my room. Um, and I left it there for the two years until I ended up getting married. Um, my door was never shut because I wanted the openness. And and I'm naturally a very private person, but I wanted the openness. I just said, this thing, it thrives in darkness and secret. Then I don't want to have darkness and secrets. Um, and, and that it, it, people having accountability type reports, um, real account real talking to people like you have to let people get to know you accountability is too often in the church it's just holy tattletaling it's just every now and then you mess up and you phone somebody and you say i did something bad and then they pray for you and you move on you don't change anything but real accountability is letting people know you and and especially with men they're really bad at this having real friends people who know you like i was always happy that i could walk into uh to my office and someone would say like, Hey, you're not doing great. And I didn't even maybe know that I was having a bad day, but they knew me well enough to knew that I was off. You have to have friends like that. You have to have people around you because nobody has ever been like in their backyard building a boat. And then suddenly been like, Oh, I should stop building a boat and go watch pornography. Um, It's always going to be a journey, a a, a slippery slope. Um, And so to have people who are there to stop you, um, on that downward descent, because again, it's, it's not, it's not about this. It's not about sex. It's not about seeing sex. It's about, uh, a very damaging thought pattern in your head. And so it's people who are going to stop you before you ever get there. Um, and then lastly, you really need to trust in God that he is the one who's going to help you because I mean, even people who, who don't believe in God, right? If you're in a 12-step program, one of the biggest things, right, is, a, is finding your higher power. People who deal with addicts, they know they need to find something that is outside themselves where we can't handle this in life. Um, like, it's, it's, if you're going to take it on by yourself, it's you against a $100 billion porn industry that is hell-bent 
on you seeing pornography. And if it's just you versus them, you're going to lose. But understanding that you are made for something greater because you are made by the great king is, is going to be key. It's going to be key in, in you being able to walk out those truths. Because like I said, it's, it comes down to that one little truth of, of our identity. And if you just try to repeat it to yourself over and over again and believe it for yourself, there's not much there. Um, but if you see who you really are in light of the incredibleness of all of creation and that the creator is the one who told you that you have value and you have worth, then that's going to be uh, a lot easier for you to fight that battle than just on your own. And for the abuse victim. Again, I, I'm not, I want to be careful what I say here because this isn't necessarily my specialty, but it's the same truth. But first There's of all, they nothing. should, they should contact the authorities. They should contact the authorities. So if, if you have been abused, uh, you need to know that, one, a, a, a lot of us understand that there's been people in your life who have not believed you. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who do, and they want to help you. And so paramount is your safety, and you need to call the authorities or let somebody know. Um, and and depending where you are, there's going to be different resources. Um, but it's the same truth that you have value that your, your value and worth is completely unchanged by anything that anybody could do to you. And, and it's like, it really is like the whole point of the, the book was for people to see themselves that way. And I want to help parents remember to communicate that to their kids that was my main thing is, is for parents to, to look at their kids and remember, like we get really, and I fail at this all the time. We get really caught up in trying to make our kids succeed at school, at behaving. We want them to be good kids and, and kids, kids are an adventure and they have all sorts of their own ideas of how they should behave and the things they do. And it's so frustrating at times and so it's that reminder that like, if we can teach them who they are and their value and how we see them and how God sees them, that's going to be the most important thing. And if we do that, that'll be successful parenting. And so how then uh, are people to get hold of the King's Daughter? The King's Daughter dot CA. Um, it is available on both Amazon, uh, both in Canada, I think around the world, all the Amazon stores, I believe. Um, but if you go to the kingsdaughter.ca, then links both to the Canadian store and the American store are right there, as well as some other um, helpful tools, some books, some videos, and there'll be more and more added to that. Um, and yeah, just I want parents to be encouraged that these are simple conversations to start. And whether it's about pornography or abuse or whatever it is that like we can actually teach our children about these things. And when we love them, that's what they need. And, and they trust us and we need to, we need to honor that trust in communicating truth. So um, I'll be putting uh, the link to how people can get the book, as well as the other uh, sites that you mentioned for people to to get help. Thank you, Josh, so much for doing this with me today. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I muted myself. One of the things that I wanted to emphasize before I, I leave you all today is uh, um, this podcast is called Thinking Biblically, but people notice that we don't spend a lot of time necessarily quoting chapter and verse, uh, but everything that we're doing here is trying to reflect a biblical perspective on life. And that's what I've been doing today with my son, Josh. And 
over and over again, we came back to the, the, the real problem is that people don't understand who they are from God's perspective, that actually we are made in God's image and we have value and we have purpose. And the more we understand that, the more we can begin to act that way and uh, both not get into the trap of things like pornography, not become perpetrators of abuse, and um, also being better equipped to not allow people to uh, to victimize us. The, the part of the good news in thinking biblically too is though if we have been perpetrators or if we have been victims, if we have been causing self-harm, whether through pornography or other things, there is still hope for us because God sent his son, the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, so that we could be set free from the consequences of what we've done, from the consequences of the things that have happened to us. And that is real. One of the things I was thinking of while Josh was talking, it's especially when he was talking about how people, and what people should do to get help, that there's those out there that are probably responding with, yeah, I tried that. Yeah, I tried that. And we wanna encourage people, don't give up. God hasn't given up on you. Don't give up on yourself. Sometimes getting out of some of these pits can be really difficult, but with God's help, we can all do it. And we can do it because of the power of God through the Messiah. And so if that's never been a reality to you, I encourage you to call out to God in Yeshua's name today. And if you need any help with that, please reach out to me. Um, of course, you can always email me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. Again, please share, subscribe, like, review um, to uh, help get this podcast out to other people. And again, look up Josh's resources in the description. And so until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Mm -hmm.